You're listening to Doing Time, Talking Crime, a podcast that showcases the research currently being conducted at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Crime, Security and Law in Freiburg, Germany. My name is Christopher Murphy, and I'll be sitting down with researchers to talk about their projects, the various methods they use, and how their findings have impacted legal, criminological, and psychological research in Germany and abroad. All this and more on Doing Time, Talking Crime. Well, uh, thank you very much for tuning in to the next episode of Doing Time, Talking Crime. Uh, on today's episode, we'll be discussing an interesting project here at the Institute uh, called Future You. Uh, using some nifty VR tools, Future You aims to assess how lo- how looking into one's own future can lead to us making better choices in the present. To do so, I'm joined in the studio by Anik Siesinger. Uh, whilst currently residing in Germany, Anik originally comes from the Netherlands, where she studied clinical child studies at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Since early 2022, Anik has been here working as a doctoral student in the Department of Criminology. Anik, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks. So, um, tell us a little bit about Future You. I gather from our discussions before the show, and I was actually able to use the Future You project uh, or the the virtual reality um, tool. You're looking at working out, uh, looking at short term mindsets and long term mindsets, uh, particularly how you can stimulate the latter. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Future You is based on this idea that criminal behavior often is a result from these these short-term mindsets. So people tend to don't really think about how their actions in the here and now uh, result in in bad behavior or bad consequences for your future. So um, if you want quick money or quick satisfaction, you don't really think about what can happen basically for you in the long term. And That is basically this differentiation that we make with um, short-term mindset and long-term mindset. So ideally, if you think more about the future um, and the future consequences of your actions, you're more inclined, basically, or you're more likely to improve your behavior in the here and now. So if you have a a future-oriented mindset, basically, Mm -hmm. and you think about your future, they will be probably making better choices in the here and now. So you will more more likely, uh, most likely, yeah, hopefully reduce um, self-destructive behaviors. Okay. And then you're using, or the future you, the concept then is to provide or to to give the participant a a chance to talk with their future self. How does that work? And you're using virtual reality to do so. And why is that? Yeah. Basically, in future you, we introduce people to um, their future self. And if you think for a moment um, about who you will be in 10 years from now, So what would you look like and um, where would you live? What job do you have? Um, What does your environment look like? Those questions are pretty hard to um, come up with Mm -hmm. just on the spot. Um, But nevertheless, it's important to to sometimes think about this person you will be in 10 years from now. Because if you have a more vivid image of of this this person, um, yeah, you'll probably um, keep her or him into account when um, yeah, making choices or... um, to make, when you make decisions in the now, you'll be not thinking just about the the now, also about the where would this be lead me to in, in yeah. ten years' time. Okay, exactly. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that it's actually quite hard to think about um, these questions. So it requires a lot of good imaginative qualities, I would say, to think about your future. And VR can take some of those difficulties away. We introduce people to their future self. Um, in our VR, you're actually able to have a conversation with this person because okay. this person is sitting at the opposite side of the table, um, basically. And this person is, is me. Exactly. In so 10 years. How do time. we do that? Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> at the start of a session, for example, people take a, a picture of their face, so basically a selfie. And an age filter is applied to the selfie, um, which enables us to create this future you, um, mm-hmm. so your future self avatar. And when people arrive in our futuristic environment, so this this VR environment, which is basically like a, a penthouse environment in mm-hmm. this high building, there's a table and um, you're sitting at this table. So you arrive at this um, virtual setting and we introduce you to the game basically that's going to be played and um, we explain um, well what the environment looks like and what the, the aim is of the, the session. 
And then we introduce this future self. So then people actually meet their future self who is sitting at the opposite side of the table. And um, yeah, then people can basically have a look into the future. Mm -hmm. So I did the program with you yesterday and I thought it was, was pretty neat that uh, when in 2022 kind of thing and a normal office environment and then you are kind of um, moved 10 years later and then outside looks different, uh, the room itself is different and then the mirror is kind of raised, right? And then bam, there you are 10 years. Exactly. Time. Yeah. Because the VR environment indeed allows you to travel through time. So you're not only mm -hmm. seeing your future self sitting at the other side of the table, you are also able to become this future mm -hmm. self. And I think this is partly where the power of, of future you lies, that um, you're not, yeah, as I said, you're not only looking at your future self, um, but you travel through time and then become this future mm -hmm. self. And Exactly, like the environment is sort of built in a way that there's these environmental cues that help you really feel like you're in the future. So in 2032, so the futuristic environment, mm -hmm. and there's like these tiny cues um, laying around that help you yeah, realize that you're in the future. And the idea is that because you don't really have to think too much about will you be in 10 years from now because you're actually this person and you look into the, the mirror that's next to you and you can see that you have some, some more wrinkles or your hair has, has changed a bit. And um, I still had hair. I was quite happy about that. See, that is uh, very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so when you actually um, are this person, then it becomes easier to think about, yeah, like who you'll be. Because your art is this future self, um, the demand basically on your cognitive or like creative abilities um, is reduced because you don't have to think about who you'll be. You're actually this person. And that is the power of VR, I guess, that you really feel like you're embodied, as we say, in, mm -hmm. in this avatar. So that basically allows for some more room to think about um, yeah, how you can help your present mm -hmm. self, for example. Sure. Let's say we take step back on my present self, you then read questions or you put questions to your future self. True. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the questions yeah. you're asking there. Well, in the, the first session, the, the first out of three, I think it's very important that you get to know your future self a bit more. And um, that's why it's sort of an, an interview session that there's um, these different cards on the table which contain quite basic questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where do you live um, or, or what kind of job do you have? Um, and those are actually meant to get used to the time traveling. Kind of warm up questions. Exactly, yeah. warm up questions and to basically support this vividness of the, the future self. And once you've answered those, so, so you basically ask the questions, these questions are recorded, then you travel through time, become your future self. And uh, subsequently, you hear those questions being asked. Yep. So then you basically give your, your response and you answer to your present self and you're allowed to travel back through time. Mm -hmm. So go back to 2022. This, this next round contains a bit more deeper um, questions. So mm -hmm. questions about um, what skills has um, your future self required um, or uh, obtained and what is something that you are proud of that happened in the last 10 years. So. These questions are a bit harder, but also necessary, I think, to gain a more deeper understanding of not just the, yeah, not just the superficial type of future self, but also a bit more like, what is this person? And so that's also talking a little bit about maybe aspirations, because obviously you can't, I mean, you can't say what have I achieved in the, the last 10 years, uh, rather than your future self would maybe say what you would like to achieve. So there's no wrong or right answers to the questions. Yeah. Okay. No, because it is, um, I think it is quite hard to think about the future and also about these kind of questions. They are in general very hard and it's not about giving the right or wrong answer. So you're obviously allowed to do something completely different mm -hmm. than your future self told you. Um, but it's more about, um, yeah, gaining this vivid image and feeling related to this future self so that you'll keep this person into account when making choice or having to make a decision. And Yeah, okay. Yeah. And tell us, you, you as a researcher are also though in the room, so to say, the virtual room, right? True. And we obviously don't want the participant um, or the user to, to know that we are there in the mm -hmm. room as well. So there's this little robot in the virtual environment called Fee. And this is basically what, the, what the does researcher. What that stand for, Fee? It's the future interviewer. Future interviewer, okay, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this inbuilt voice distortion in Fee. 
So Fee is basically the researcher talking to the participant and, and guiding the session. Um, but then, yeah, participants um, don't really hear the researcher's uh, voice. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about three rounds of questions. Um, how long is a, a participant in there? Because I, I mean, I found it, I, I, was, I did one round. <laughs> Some of the demands were maybe taken away by a virtual reality, but it was still, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was demanding. How do you plan to do that? How long will a session take? On average, the sessions take around 20 to 30 minutes, um, mm -hmm. very depending on how uh, much participants elaborate on their answers or um, how how much they tell you. Um, some participants are so present in, in this virtual environment that they keep on talking to their future okay. selves and some others are very short, just give an answer um, and yeah, are done basically in 20 minutes. So, mm -hmm. But in general, we, we want to keep it around 30 minutes. Max. Okay. Yeah. And what's the reaction generally of the participants? Are they... Uh do they laugh when they see their future self? Are they shocked? Uh, or, uh, I mean, 10 years from now? Yeah, mixed uh, reactions we get, um, especially in this first session where everything is new and, mm. and uh, people are introduced to basically both avatars, so their present self and their future self. Uh, mostly they laugh. They find okay. it funny. Um, <laughs> there is some kind of shock, um, but they get used to these avatars very quickly. And okay. I think that is also a very important aspect of, of virtual reality. Um, people actually need to feel that they are the avatar that they're basically controlling. Mm -hmm. um, so we take some time for the participant to get use of that body and really feel like that they are that avatar. So that, mm -hmm. that's why actually there's these two mirrors in, in the setting. And we do these basically exercises so that people mm -hmm. really see that, oh, if I raise my hand in real life, the yes. avatar's hand in VR also um, yeah goes up basically. Okay. So. Yeah. By doing those, um, yeah, those exercises and and um, having the mirror in there, people, the, the brain is tricked into really believing that yeah. you are that, um, yeah, that avatar. So people quite soon feel like they are they are there, and and they they yeah become like they feel related to the avatars they are to controlling, the yeah, self. Okay. and the future yeah, self, yeah. Okay. And obviously, it can be shocking. Um, I mean, ten years from now, but <laughs> <laughs> in general, we get positive. Um, yeah, Generally feedback. positive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no one's been crying. Uh, <laughs> so far, not. So far, not. Okay. <laughs> the program exists, um, and you are collecting data, or is this just a pilot phase at the moment? Uh, currently, we are collecting uh, data. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, it's a big study that we're currently running at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands. And at the moment, we are testing with students. Uh, so first year university students. And as I said at the beginning, this uh, virtual reality intervention is basically developed for reducing criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. And that is not really what we're studying with the current um, sample of right. participants. Um, okay. But nevertheless, we can test if the mechanism works. So if participants uh, feel more related to their future self and have a more vivid image of their future self, will they well reach their goals more easily or, or gain better um, university grades? Um, are they able to obtain obstacles they um, uh, yeah, run into? So we have some different outcomes, um, but nevertheless, we can, we can test if the mechanism works. So okay. if their self-destructive behavior reduces. Reduces, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. And so I guess that kind of uh, skips nicely then to the, the next section um, about, okay, we, we know the future you and we have the concept of talking to your future self and maybe taking your future self more into consideration in the here and now when taking actions. How then could this be used to change, uh, I guess, what, what you call criminal trajectories? I think there's multiple um, reasons why VR um, as a medium, so as, a, as a technology, would fit this population quite well and why future use fits uh, the population quite um, well. So um, let's start with the technology. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, um, um, VR is able to take away some of your imagination um, or like this this uh, demand on your imag yeah. imagination co um, qualities. and. Um, I think in general, this population often has um, some lower um, intellectual abilities. Mm -hmm. or, um, the current treatment is very verbal, so it's lots of talking and and that might not always fit the person very well. Mm -hmm. And especially if, if then there's these questions asking you like, okay, but where do you want to be five years from now? Or like, where do you want to be 10 years from now? That um, can be difficult to envision, definitely. and probably particularly if you're in... Jail, maybe, or something yeah. like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah True. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's why these um, technologies as yeah, virtual reality or like a smartphone app, um, mm. those are uh, more engaging and, and fun perhaps to use, but also um, have some quite strong rehabilitation. Um, mm. And so what will be uh, maybe 
kind of on, on the spot here, but what would be questions then that, that you would put to a uh, someone in, in the prison population then? What would be possible? So definitely the, the intervention content at, as um, as it currently is designed for like the student population would yeah. have to be changed a bit. Yeah. Um, however, I'm not even sure if we have to change it that much because in general, um, it's not so much about being able to answer specific questions in mm. future, but more about instilling this future self oh. identification. And okay. we believe that um, if we let people uh, gain a more vivid image of their future self, their behavior will improve in the here and now. So okay. we basically would tweak um, certain um, questions a bit and um, definitely, um, well, again, test if the intervention's content fits this population. But mm. I don't think we definitely have to ask very different questions. And But out of my head, if we had to do that, we, we definitely... Um, um, yeah, would would probably let them gain more insight or try to let them gain more insight in what the consequences of their current actions are and mm-hmm. how this will affect their future self. Okay. Um, yeah, and that currently is not um, not that um, needed, I think, for the student population. Right, okay, yeah. No, okay, but I understand then it's not so much the questions, it's more the, the concept as a whole then to take take your future self into account. Yeah. Um, that would then mean, though, that it's it's not obviously a standalone intervention I'm gathering it's something that you would use as a to to assist I think um, forensic populations so these criminal populations are in general quite hard to treat um, and um, that is because there's quite often more um, problems going on in in Mm -hmm. someone's lives it's not just um, criminal behavior there's more going on so that said I think it's good to have basically this this toolbox um, with different um, tools in there to be able to treat this population and I think future you could be one of those tools. So during a certain um, trajectory, you can mm. basically pick from different, um, yeah, different tools out of the toolbox. And I would think that that future you would be one of them. Maybe it works as a standalone uh, intervention that we don't know yet. Mm. Uh, but I uh, envision it more to be, yeah, like one of the the things people or like um, therapists can can choose from. Okay. How come um, you went with ten years? Um, like, uh, would it have been more? realistic 30 years or 40 years down the line or, or what was the this, this choice for 10 years yeah so based on some previous studies um that that have taken place with for example age range as as 30 years or, or 40 years um previous um, vr studies or previous uh imagine yourself in 30 years time studies um yeah i think the the, the last one so okay. imagine yeah. yourself and um i don't think there's this golden age range that will be most effective. And Mm. this paradigm basically has never been studied among criminal populations before. So we don't really know if 50 years um, or a 50 year older future self would be more effective compared to a 10 year older self. Mm -hmm. Um, That's definitely something to find out. However, I think that a 10 year age range is basically um, short enough to be able to have some idea of who this person will be and feel a bit more related to this person compared to a, um, a 50-year-old, because that's okay. perhaps too far it's, away. And sure. yeah, that is um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, harder that, to... That <laughs> yeah. makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Especially, I guess, when you're talking with a, a, a population who's maybe 18 to 20 or something like that. It's, yeah. Yeah, okay. Definitely. You're listening to Doing Time, Talking Crime, a podcast by the Max Planck Institute for the study of crime, security and law. Um, you said something about the, you're working on an app as well. Um, do you want to enlighten yeah. us there? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, our future smartphone app, that is also taking advantage of the possibilities of technology. Um, and smartphones is, is a technology that everyone carries around and you have it with you 24-7 uh, in some cases. And therefore, it's a super interesting platform, basically, to see how we can use smartphones to um, yeah, help people uh, change their behavior, for example. And because smartphones are basically nonstop um, with a person, yeah, sure. it is a, yeah, a very interesting platform to um, provide interventions on. And also to help people think about their future self on a daily basis, for example. Mm-hmm. And that is something that VR can't do. So we can't tell people to come to the laboratorium, for example, every day to meet their future self. Um, so there's this uh, limitation of VR, probably, that a sure, smartphone app can um, yeah, yeah support. Because and- uh, obviously you need a reasonable amount of equipment with the VR. and Okay, and so you've yeah. got the, the future you in your pocket. So you've programmed the app. 
And how does the app, uh, I mean, it can't obviously create a virtual environment, how does it try and stimulate you to think about your future self? Yeah, the former version of our smartphone app was basically a chat conversation uh, with your future self. So it was sort of a WhatsApp-like conversation with your future self and he or she gave you on a daily basis advices or, or um, fun facts or some, some information about why it's mm -hmm. important to think about this future self person. Um, and um, also gave you some tips and tricks basically to reach your goals or to, to deal with obstacles that might be in the way or of um, getting uh, or reaching your goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was basically a three week long intervention that every day you interact with your future self for like five minutes um, on average. And I think in the current version of our app, it's, it's um, slightly different, but based on the same idea. Um, and the, the interesting part of that current study that we are running is that we can really compare these types of technology as well. So what is, for example, more effective? Is it just once every week experiencing uh, VR, so mm. a very vivid image yeah. of your future self? Or is it more these tiny daily busts of future yeah, self information? Yeah, basically? Yeah. Okay. In the app, uh, it's not like uh, I'm not saying future you, what will I be where will I be in 10 years' time, and then answering it. It's more that the app is notifying, reminding me, hey, think about your future self. Uh, I'm not conversing with it or with an AI or anything like that. Um, no, there's no AI um, in there. So it's a pre-programmed chat, yep. basically. Um, but still, um, we, we ask the questions uh, like, uh, where will you be uh, 10 years from now? Okay. And also they, they travel through time as well um, with a certain module, basically, in the app. There's, a, there's an inbuilt time travel portal. Mm -hmm. It's less vivid than, than having this sure, in VR. Sure, but um, yeah. more frequent, less vivid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you're also testing the app now? Yeah. And how do you measure engagement? And how has, how has the engagement been <laughs> thus far with the app? Yeah. So that is something with, with smartphone app interventions that I think we always assume that with the more people engage with an app, so the, the more they like this app, um, the better their outcomes will be or the mm -hmm. more benefits basically they mm -hmm. reap from this intervention. But we don't actually really know whether people just need to use the app regardless of whether they like it or not, or if they really need to be uh, like so involved and, and um, engaged more in the effective um, sense. And that is something that I'm um, studying at the moment. So what is, um, yeah, and are, uh, are those concepts basically of using an app and, and really being engaged in the app, or mm -hmm. are those concepts um, similar and relate they, uh, do they relate to each other? Or is it um, basically the same the same thing? And and how important is this engagement? Um, but um, and how do you measure the the? I mean, am I really feeling the app and using it, or am I like, oh yeah, I'll just fill it in because uh, I should yeah. take part in the study? How, can you measure the? The level of engagement? Yeah, yeah, good question. That is also something that I'm investigating. Um, we use surveys um, for that. So we ask people what their opinion was about the app okay. and certain app-specific features. But we also draw from the app uh, its usage data. So apps uh, like these technology, they collect uh, loads of data for us. So it would be very beneficial to see whether we can actually use that data in research. And this, this has taken place um, already in uh, different kind of apps and, and different types of technology. But I think my research um, about this relationship between engagement and these, these usage data, the, the very objective usage data, mm -hmm. like how do these types of, of concepts basically relate, that is quite uh, quite new. That has not um, been okay. studied yet. So I can't tell you. Uh, no, sure. Maybe I'm in a few a, years. There's always so. a reason yeah, <laughs> to, to, to have you back on. Um, can the listeners download it or is that the plan to put it on the App Store? Or? Uh, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, okay. Since we're collecting data with it, it would okay. um, yeah um, harm the data collection. But who knows? Uh, maybe our future selves can. Yeah, uh, you might be the first some. company to make some money by making people look older rather than younger. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Anik, before I let you go, uh, I'm going to push the uh, the time machine button here <laughs> and uh, and zoom us to the future, 2032. Uh, where do you envisage yourself being then? Yeah, that's a good question and. I always think that after working with Future You uh, for two years already, I, I would be able to have a very vivid image of my future <laughs> self. But I must disappoint you, I, I still haven't. I'm still okay. working on that. But I think she um, she is still involved in doing research. Mm -hmm. um, she might have some clinical work in her weeks as well. Uh, and yeah, I think she's a, a happy and positive person who, well, who knows, maybe still even lives in Freiburg. Oh, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, before you ask me the same question, I'm going to wrap it up here. But uh, Anik, thanks so much for coming on to the show. It's been a pleasure having you here and learning more about future you. Thanks.
Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to today's program. If you would like to hear additional podcasts or learn more about our research, please visit our website at www.csl.mpg.de.